Well, a bunch of you asked for it, so here we go. Like an 8th grade science class, we're going to talk about mountains, rivers, deserts, and what a jerk water is. Look at what's become of us. I'm DC Ferguson, author of the Wicked Instruments series, and this is 6 Tips for Geography and Map Making. If we're going to have a world map, we need to remember that any world more alien than Earth is going to require so many more special rules that we just don't have time for. So goodbye methane atmosphere and desert world, we're going to look at humanoid habitable planets here, or what our friends on the Enterprise call Class M planets. And if we're doing that, then we need to understand plate tectonics. The parts of the world that plate tectonics affect are continental structure, oceanic activity, and mountain volcano creation. So let's dig right in here. The cracking, splitting, and movement of tectonic plates first come up when you draw your continents. Why? Because forming land masses, for the most part, are going to be uh, coming from a Pangaea-like singular land mass ocean water seeping into all these little cracks and generally just being what water is and make the tectonic plates do this little dance. Uh, so whatever map you make, for the most part, is going to be in one phase of this continental drift or another. Uh, like puzzle pieces, the continents should shift apart but still look like they're part of the same whole. Some plates have what are called divergent boundaries. Uh, these guys are pushing out everything on either side of them. For us, this is seen in the Atlantic, always pushing the west closer to Asia and Australia. So, once you have your continents drawn, let's see what to do with them. So, let's get dirty. Literally. Um, we have a bunch of these epic piles of dirt here, and we want to know what's going on with them. Uh, let's start with the coastlines. They obey a sort of uh, fractal pattern in the way that they form, usually. Um, these rocky, jagged fellows, they're good, developed coastlines, and this will be where our port cities and harbors are going to locate because they create natural harbors. Uh, we want uh, rocky. Uh, rocky is good. Uh, smooth coastlines are underdeveloped and sandy, uh, like these islands here, um, because they're constantly being pelted by waves, which is bad for boats. So early in technology, smooth is bad for us. Um, if you are making any kind of uh, habitable area that might have port towns, it's a very good idea to keep this in mind. Now, off of your continents, we might just have some continental islands. Uh, the parts where the continent sinks into the sea uh, might have had a little brother that follows behind it, but can never quite keep up. Um, this is a continental island. It's still attached to the shelf of the mainland it came from. Uh, but wait, we might have some more going on here. Uh, where those tectonic plates we were talking about are rubbing together, if one gets pushed under the other, we have a process called subduction. And all that rock grinding about, it piles up and we get volcanoes. If it happens out in the middle of the ocean, the rock can pile up so high we get parts above the sea called volcanic islands. Uh, so... Two kinds of islands, you say? No, but wait, there's more. Uh, if the volcano on the island goes dormant and a reef forms around it, we get tropical islands, barrier reefs, and atolls. That is three for the price of one. Act now, and I'll even throw in a lagoon for free. I'm going to tell you a story of romance and intrigue. Here we have India. One day, India met Asia, and their love could not be denied. They smushed and kissed and basically mushed into each other so hard. The world finally had enough of all that kissy face and put up a wall between them. Uh, the rock of these two landmasses on different tectonic plates made them crinkle and fold at the edges, and that's how we got the Himalayas. Um, it's also how we got the Andes, but that was just South America out in the ocean playing with itself. Um, these are fold mountains, and as you can see, they get very big. They also look, occur on the outer perimeters of the plates. Uh, when the crust of inner areas of the plate start cracking, this is a process called rifting, and areas that split and move and adjust elevations are uh, called fault block mountains, uh, like our friends here in Death Valley. Uh, then we have plateaus. 
Um, these are areas where all that sweet, hot magma under the earth pushes up a section of the earth, and it sticks out like a sore thumb, so it gets smacked around by wind and rain and eroding all the pointy parts off until we have a nice flat top here, um, like the Colorado Plateau, which includes our buddy the Grand Canyon. Now, we have mountains, so what do they do? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, winds travel in a clockwise motion in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. The areas where winds come off the sea and drop their moisture onto land, well, that gives us forests here at the base. Uh, forests don't need mountains. Uh, they only need water to thrive. So anywhere winds come off the sea and smack land, there's a chance for a forest. What kind of forest? Well, slow down, we'll get there. Um, the windward side of the mountain has all of our moisture, uh, but what about the other side? Uh, well, what's called the leeward side of the mountain gets cool stuff too. Well, not really cool, more like really hot. How hot? Like a desert hot. Um, no moisture is going over these mountains, so nothing is growing, and they just happen to be between the 38th parallels. That's where desert magic happens. So, no moisture comes off the mountains, no rain is forming here in this area, um, which is called a rain shadow, and that's making it super dry and hot and dead. But, like forests, we don't always need a mountain and its stinking rain shadow to have a desert. Sometimes we just need to be in between the 38th parallels and far enough inland that all the air is warm and it won't give up any of its moisture. Uh, these greedy winds that don't like to share made up the Sahara. Now, since we're talking about parallels, uh, let's uh, mention this here. Um, here in the 23 degrees or less range, we like it hot and sticky and wet, so we'll have jungles. Above that, we'll have forests. Um, above the 45th, we start seeing evergreens. Those buggers will survive in anything cold. Um, so, as far as forest goes, that was, you know, a nice and simple finish, because we're talking about basics here. What, you want more? Alright, fine. Rivers are lazy, uh, marauding beasts. Let me explain both parts of that. The lazy part is that rivers will always take the path of least resistance to get themselves into the ocean. Uh, they're beasts because they will carve through solid rock to do that. So while you'll definitely see two separate branches of a river form like Voltron and become like one super river, their path of least resistance will never split them um, up on the way to the ocean. Uh, so, rivers also go from highest elevation to lowest elevation, along the steepest route possible. Uh, so, follow the river away from the mountains, smooth sailing, it's all downhill. Uh, follow the river towards the mountains, good luck climbing that. Rivers are made up of either piles of melting mountain snow if you're north enough, or, uh, more commonly, rainwater, which pools up before deciding to leave the nest at the top of their mountains and going off tearing through all the rock as they try to get to the ocean. How beastly are these waters? Well, ask the Colorado River. At the same rate that the Grand Canyon was forming taller and taller by centimeters a year for millions of years, the Colorado River was keeping pace to grind all that new mountain away while it was forming. So, now you have a big fat giant canyon in the middle of what should have been one solid plateau. But, if your river lands are in a spot where they can only go uphill in every direction, the party ain't over yet. Uh, the river says, hold my beer, and fills up all the uphill, making up what's called a basin, before finding its merry way downhill again. If the basin is super massive, you can get a lake. And once again, rivers are lazy, and only one river will empty out of the lake toward the ocean. Now, we've described one way that lakes form, so here's the other. If your world is far past its ice age, then we're looking at huge glaciers that have been dragging heavy stuff behind them as they left, like a pyramid head creeping around with a sword behind him. And like his sword, anything these glaciers dragged along is digging and cutting into everything it touches. So we get these pock marks and holes all over the landscape. Keep in mind, this is happening in your upper parallels, but the glacial movement leaves all this fresh water behind in the holes. That water isn't just going to sit stagnant, it wants to get out the, of the house every time it rains. So it looks for some downhills and a couple of lonely rivers to hook up with, and they go off tearing up the joint. Water is a troublemaker, that's, that's the lesson to take away from all this, folks. Now, 
we have a bunch of uh, different land masses here, and now we need to, need to make things live on it. Well, everything that grows to live on your world did so according to some loose but predictable patterns. As a general rule in a given swath of continent, animals, plants, and people will be most similar from east to west. This includes everything from uh, pigmentation of the skin to the spread of technology. Wait a second, DC, you say to yourself in this conversation you're having with your computer monitor. Um, how are skin color and technology even remotely related? Well, see, this guy over here in this parallel invents something that plows the land better. He tells two friends, one goes off west and the other goes north. The guy who goes out west finds similar conditions that make it so the plow works as intended, while the guy who went up north finds that the air earth here is colder, harder, and more rocky, uh, rendering the spread of this technology useless. He throws away the plow and never shows it to anybody, so it never spreads further north. Meanwhile, the technology goes east to west as far as it can w and will go and still be useful. Um, diseases, animals, and people actually work in a very similar trend. The people, animals, and disease carriers don't shift wildly uh, towards other climates they're not suited for. Think about how you learned your advanced history classes. It starts in Mesopotamia, Egypt, and, and so on, and then it graduates to Southern Europe, Western Africa, the Middle East, and so on and so forth. What you're seeing there are the beginnings of life starting from a central point and then creeping outward toward new lands. Generation by generation, they get further from their distant relatives. The reduced amount of sun changes their skin tone. The local wildlife takes on different coloring and traits of their new habitats. Uh, the diseases that are born from these areas are distinctly different from the ones hundreds of miles away. Uh, that's also what makes visitors from another land so susceptible to these diseases. They're not new to the locals, but they're new to travelers that have no immunity to them. So, it's important to consider your world's own cradle of civilization, because wherever the center is, your world's development spread out from there slowly but surely over the course of dozens of generations. So, all the research and uh, everything for this episode was actually brought to you by my go-to guy for geography, C.J. Perry. If I'm going to shamelessly plug in my videos, this week it ought to be him. Uh, his new novel, Rise of the Shadow Walker, The Apostate Prince, is now available for pre-order. I've already gotten my hands on a preview copy, folks, and I'm telling you, this is the next book on your list if you're a fan of dark fantasy, wizards, or magic swords. I mean, dang, that cover, right? So... Don't forget to like and subscribe. Check us both out on the Art of the Arcane blog. As always, I'm DC Ferguson. Now have fun and get crafting.